Welcome everyone to this first event in a new public lecture series on climate justice, jointly organised by the Irish Centre for Human Rights and the Ryan Institute at NUI Galway. My name is Maeve O'Rourke, I'm a lecturer here at the Irish Centre for Human Rights and I extend this welcome to all of you on behalf of Professor Siobhan Mullally, Director of the Irish Centre for Human Rights and Professor Charles Balan, Director of the Ryan Institute. There's live streaming tonight of the entire proceedings, just so that everybody is aware of that, including our Q&A, because we feel that lots of interesting information will come out at that point. Um, for anyone you might know who isn't able to be here, you'll see the live stream link on the Twitter pages of the Ryan Institute and the Irish Centre for Human Rights. We're delighted to see so many people here. Thank you for coming. We're extremely grateful to our musicians, Rosa Carroll and Isaac Scanlon. And thanks also to all the postdoctoral and doctoral scholars and the admin staff who've been so helpful in putting today together. We're most grateful to the president of NUI Galway, Professor Kieran O'Hogartig, for his support for this climate justice lecture series and for opening today's proceedings. So I'd like to welcome our president of the university to give his opening remarks, after which I'll introduce you to each of the speakers and to our running order for this evening. Thanks, Maeve. Good evening, Marcus. Good evening, Officer and Behan Shaw. I'm Pranona. I guess Lou, a cohesive connection. They always say it's better to have a, a crowded room uh, rather than one that isn't. So it's great to see such that great such great crowds of crowds have gathered. Uh, and I'm often asked to uh, come along to events such as this and open them. And I was particularly pleased to choose and say yes to this one uh, because, as our uh, colleagues and students will know, we're currently devising our strategy and thinking of that NUI Galway strategy will be values led. And when we thought about that, we uh, asked our stakeholders, students and staff in particular, and others as well, what our values should be, what our values are currently, but what, they all, what values we should also grow. And this particular evening, climate justice and the role of activists in that context fits very snugly and very appropriately into those five values as we have developed them. Uh, the first value which came particularly from our colleagues was the value of respect, and there's nothing more respectful uh, than respect for our climate and our planet. And I'm particularly pleased that uh, there are so many people who are keen to show that respect by coming today and, and having this conversation, which is the start of a series, I think, which we will we'll, uh, develop over the year, which is a series of conversations about what we might do better, and not just talking, as the poster in front of us says, but doing as well. Uh, the second value, which again came from colleagues, was one of expertise and excellence, and again, particularly pleased that we have a well-informed debate here, one which is evidence-based, one which is drawing very much on the, uh, the expertise that we have in, in two very valuable uh, sets of colleagues in the university, the Irish Centre for Human Rights and the Ryan Institute, uh, and the excellence that comes from research and teaching and activism uh, from both of those areas. Uh, the third value which came really from our students was one of openness and inclusiveness, accessibility, and again, particularly pleased to welcome into the aula and the quad uh, people who are interested in this area from the university and from outside. Uh, it fits very much into two ideas I had when I came to Galway, uh, that the, this particular room, the aula, should be a public space uh, and a space that is available for debates and argument and things of import. Uh, and I want the aula and the quad to be much more of that, so hopefully over the next while we'll have more students, maybe even classrooms more so involved here uh, than heretofore and that, that you as students and as stakeholders in the university see this space as your own. Uh, and that's the second part of what I thought coming to NUI Galway is I, I lived, I grew up five minutes up the road and I used to walk through town or into town through college uh, and I saw this very much as part of my furniture, part of my space. And I'm very keen that others see the same. There are people who don't see this university as their, the part of their furniture and part of their space and I'm particularly keen that we have a university uh, uh, which is a university physically with no gates, but also conceptually. Uh, we have no way to close up this university. We have no gates. And I'm very keen that this university be an open space for debate uh, and for uh, doing as well as uh, thinking and, and acti uh, acting as well as uh, articulation. And I'm particularly welcoming of you today in that context that this is your space and see this as a place where you can have access uh, to have debates such as this. And then the, the 
Fourth value, which is coming particularly from our, our outside stakeholders, is the sense of what is it that makes NUI Galway different? What is it that's distinctive about NUI Galway? Uh, we have a very pleasant campus, a very pleasant campus both physically and otherwise, uh, and that's something which is in our favour. But we also have here uh, people who debate things in, uh, and particular uh, uh, debates of interest. And again, this evening, I think we have a very distinctive uh, set of uh, uh, interdisciplinary perspectives coming from the Ryan Institute and, and Human Rights, two areas where, for which anywhere Galway is uh, justifiably well known. Uh, the area of climate and, and sustainability, climate change and climate action, and the area of human rights. And bringing those two areas together is something we do in NUI Galway differently than elsewhere. And the fact that we're outside a capital city and not in the centre of things very often, the fact that we're on the edge, uh, the fact that we have the Burren to our south and Connemara to our west, the fact that we have land and ocean meeting here, I think we have something different here that isn't elsewhere. And this debate, I think, very much encapsulates that, that we are conscious here of our responsibility to the land and the ocean, uh, much more so than others, and that we can have a different debate here than elsewhere. And then the final value uh, that, again, comes from our students, and one which is particularly fitting this evening, is the value of sustainability. And when we canvassed our students about what, we would like, what they would like as a value of the university, openness, accessibility, inclusivity, inclusivity was one, but sustainability was the other. And again, today, uh, this evening, we capture that uh, very elegantly and eloquently here. And one of the things we're thinking about in sustainability, it's, it's quite wide ranging. We are going to make quite ambitious commitments around the sustainability of NUI Galway and our contribution to the sustainability of, of the planet and to climate action, climate change. So watch that space. The U university management team will discuss tomorrow and over the next uh, number of weeks what commitments we will make between here and Christmas in that regard. And we will be ambitious because we are with our students demand that we be ambitious. Uh, and in the context of climate change, we're doing very good research here. We have a research facility at Mace Head, uh, which is very uh, conscious and very focused on measuring uh, changes to our climate. We've research in, uh, in marine, in the area of marine and the environment more generally. And so the research area, the area of teaching and learning and our impact on society is something we're very keen uh, to uh, articulate and to dial up because this is something I think which is particularly important to us. And again, this evening's debate captures that very, much, very, very well. And I'd say one final thing on, on this, it's the value, as I say, which our students have asked us to, uh, to uh, be called to, to uh, do something about. So it's a value that is coming, it's a challenging one, one that challenges us and is demanded of us. And originally we had the idea that we have five values for a five-year uh, strategic plan, that we would have a year for each value. So we would have the year of respect, the year of excellence, the year of openness, accessibility, inclusivity, the year of distinctiveness and the year of sustainability. And we thought originally the, excuse me, the year of respect would be the one we'd start with, because that's the one we felt had captured the imagination most. But again, we're thinking that we will start next year with the year of sustainability to signal the urgency of climate action uh, and the urgency of this particular issue, so that we will commit that by 2020, we will have achieved particular uh, outcomes, particular measurable outcomes in the context of climate change and sustainability. Uh, and we will do that immediately. We'll set out policies uh, uh, that will commit us to being, to having particular uh, activities and particular ambitious targets met by the end of next year and by the end of this decade that we will, for example, be carbon neutral uh, and that we will have achieved those outcomes as well. We are already working with industry in Galway, Boston Scientific in particular, to achieve those goals. As a university, we think the same so that uh, we will have that sense of urgency. And one thing I would say to you, and we've had discussions already with the management team about this, challenge us about sustainability. Uh, make us honest. Be angry. Give us ideas about how this university can contribute to sustainability, not only on this campus, but in this city and in our region and more widely. So this is an area where we have, there is urgency. And as a university, we, were, we are determined to make a change. But feel free to challenge us, to make sure that we are on the right track, to give us ideas about how we can do better. Because the future of the planet is responsibility of all of us, and very much a responsibility of this university. And one thing I've been very keen on consistently, and as, a, as we journey through life, that is a responsibility of all of us to leave the planet 
and the, and the world in a better place than we found it. And this generation has not found it in a great place. And this university has a responsibility to do something about that. So as we commit, as we will and launch our strategy in, in December and January to sustainable NUI Galway, make sure that we are meeting that commitment and make us honest, be angry, uh, be activist as you are and uh, be sure, make sure that we are on the right road to committing to a sustainable NUI Galway, as I say, not just the campus, but the city and the region more generally. So particularly pleased, on the Sir Van Sean Ucht, Leshen, and on Cora Shaw Oskult, Mar Tashe, Lean Shay Leshen and Luke, not Hagwing Mar 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 Oskult. That those values of respect, excellence, those values of openness, accessibility, inclusiveness, distinctiveness, but most of all sustainability, they live here, and uh, the conversation starts here. And I'm particularly pleased, therefore, to open uh, this evening's debate and to be with you, St uh, NUI Galway stands with you in this debate, but also in your activism, uh, and be angry if you need to be with us if we don't uh, stand up to our commitments. So, I mean, I thank you. Thanks a million to Professor Hogartig, the University President, for those warm remarks. So to the rest of the evening now in the running order, we'll hear from each of our speakers individually, and then we'll stop for a Q&A session. Following the Q&A, Dr. Su Ming Ku of NUI Galway will gather together the key threads that have emerged from the evening. And she'll also introduce you to the work of the Ryan Institute here at NUI Galway and its relationship to human rights. Dr. Su Ming, who I'm very glad is co-hosting with me tonight, is a lecturer in political science and sociology at NUI Galway and cluster leader of the Ryan Institute's socioeconomic impact research cluster and also a member of the Royal Irish Academy. We'll finish the evening then by hearing from each of our speakers their, call, their primary call to action and who they directed at. So to our speakers, we are extremely grateful to each and every one of you for joining us here this evening. For the week that's in it, it's been hectic, I have no doubt, for each of you. And each of your work has given us all in the broader community, in Ireland and internationally, of course, as a whole, as activists. You've given us hope, inspiration, and also, I think, your work has made us all feel, myself included, that we need to get going and we need to do more. We're deeply grateful for you for take, to you for taking the time to share your experience and your insights your experience of working on climate injustices, your insights into what more needs to be done, how it can be done, and who can take on responsibility for doing it. Speaking of the week that's in it, I think we're very lucky that this debate is going to be very current. And we know just today, the government announced what it would say is a significant measure, and you may have particular thoughts on that. And it'll be really interesting here to hear that. Um, their announcement at the UN Climate Action Summit about what more Ireland can do. So our first speaker will be Neve Garvey. Neve joins us from Trocra. For those of you who don't know, an Irish Catholic charity established in 1973, which works with communities in over 20 countries focusing on food and resource rights, women's empowerment and humanitarian response. Trocra has been heavily involved in campaigning in Ireland as well for this country to play its part in mitigating the impact of climate change on the people in the countries where Trocra primarily works. Neve is head of, free, of policy and advocacy at Trocra and has worked at Trocra for over 10 years. And prior to joining Trocra, Neve worked for the Institute of Development Studies in the UK and for Christian Aid Ireland. She's going to open our evening very helpfully by providing an overview of what Trocra understands climate justice to mean as a concept and what the key themes are in the climate justice activism that we see taking place around us today. Kaluba Banda is our second speaker. She's a student on NUI Galway's award-winning Masters in Climate Change, Agriculture and Food Security and an Irish Aid Fellow at the University. Kaluba has extensive experience of working with farmers, including in Zambia, and she will provide reflections on climate justice from the perspective of smallholder farmers and the rural poor in sub-Saharan Africa. Bulalani Mfako is a seasoned activist and community worker in both South Africa and Ireland, 
with a background in management systems and a BA in public administration from the University of the Western Cape and an MA in politics from University College Dublin. He is an extremely able and moving representative of the movement of asylum seekers in Ireland. Bulalani will, will discuss experiences of climate justice activists in rural communities in South Africa, the relationship between business and the state on climate justice matters, and the persecution of climate justice activists, which will lead him to a focus as well on how Ireland treats asylum seekers. Sive O'Neill is a PhD candidate in the School of Politics and International Relations, a political theorist, and also a lecturer on environmental politics at UCD. Sive is a very well-known voluntary environmental advocate and organizer, primarily with Friends of the Irish Environment, which is also a part of the Stop Climate Chaos Coalition in Ireland. Sive will speak, I think, I hope, about a bit about the Friends of the Irish Environment's recent case that was decided in the High Court last week, known as Climate Case Ireland, among other things. Eddie Mitchell hails from Leitrim. Um, for those of you who may not know, a, a county north of Galway, which borders Fermanagh in Northern Ireland, in part. Eddie works as a farmer and building contractor and has been instrumental in his spare time, in which probably is the most of your time organizing, um, essentially doing more than two jobs, organizing the Save Leitrim and Love Leitrim community campaigns. And he'll talk to us about campaigning to achieve a ban on fracking in Ireland possibly his worries about possible fracking in Northern Ireland. And he'll also discuss the community's concerns in Leitrim about the planting of large amounts of Sitka spruce. And Saoirse McHugh, our final speaker, is well known to many of you, no doubt, as a result of her extremely powerful election campaign this past May. She stood on behalf of the Green Party for election to the European Parliament um, for the Midlands Northwest constituency and was only narrowly denied a seat. Her election manifesto, I think, was striking in its statement that climate breakdown is the most critical challenge humanity has ever faced, but also extremely uplifting in the vision that you presented for a sustainable future for the environment and all of us who depend on it. Saoirse will address the connections between climate breakdown, social justice and capitalism. And I think she might discuss her primary passion, which is agriculture. And finally, I think we do have students from the Environmental Society at NUIG in our audience. And um, they organized a very impressive turnout last Friday along with the Students' Union for the climate strike. And they might let us know from the audience at the end of the evening what their future plans are. So without further ado, some of our speakers have presentations, others don't. So I'll just move you on and anyone with a presentation, this is what you need. So without further ado, um, I'll welcome Niamh Garvey, and after that you might just um, lead yourselves. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thanks for that very kind introduction, and thank you to NUI Galway and the Irish Centre for Human Rights and the Ryan Institute. I'm really delighted to be here tonight for this inaugural climate justice lecture. Um, I'm delighted also to be sharing the platform um, with so many really great activists. And I think that theme of activism in relation to climate justice is incredibly timely. I think we were all moved and inspired by the massive day of action there on Friday. And I think falling today with the UN Climate Summit, I think it's, we, we await the results of the summit, but I think it will be clear that activism will continue to play a vital role in how we deal with the climate crisis going forward. So I've been asked to talk a little bit, reflect on the concept of climate justice and, and climate justice activism. And I suppose the key at the heart of climate justice is that it puts issues of human rights and inequality right at the centre of how we understand the problem of climate change and also critically how we respond to the climate crisis. And for Throkra, this is most powerfully illustrated by the fact that climate change is devastating for many of the world's poorest people. People living in poverty in developing countries continue to be on the front lines of a crisis that they did the least to contribute to. The number of climate-related disasters doubled between 1990 and 2016, 
Communities across East and Southern Africa, for example, have been facing successive droughts, as well as extreme events such as Cyclone Ida earlier this year, which left 1,200 people dead and thousands more missing. And I'm sure we're going to hear a lot more from that region, from, from Kaluba, reflecting on um, small-scale farmers. These kind of impacts point to one part of the climate justice response that's required. And this is significant volumes of finance to support adaptation um, by way of compensation um, for the critical impacts of climate change on vulnerable communities. And this is why at the international level, at the UN negotiations on climate response, this is why developing countries put issues around loss and damage and financing for adaptation as a critical part of the global solution. But there really is a limit to adaptation. Um, all of the impacts that we have seen so far are based on 1.1 degrees Celsius rise of, based on um, pre-industrial levels. But as the World Meteorological Organization report issued just yesterday points out, the impacts of climate change are accelerating. They're happening far quicker and I suppose far more, with far more impact than had even previously been projected. And so climate change poses an existential threat to all of us. And again, it's the most vulnerable people in all countries who will be at the front lines of a future that must be avoided. The impacts of a two degrees rise will include 1.5 billion people exposed to deadly heat stress, 600 million people exposed to increases in vector-borne diseases such as malaria, severe widespread drought and water shortage, and mass displacement and migration. Michelle Bachelet, the UN Commissioner on Human Rights, recently stated, the world has never seen such a threat to human rights at this scope. The economies of all nations, the institutional, political, cultural fabric of every state and the rights of all your people and future generations will be impacted. And she really underlines here how in all cases it is the most marginalized, whether that's women, whether it's children, whether it's people living in um, economic uh, constraints, are always going to be at the forefront and most impacted. And this is what climate injustice points to. And as an activist in climate justice over the past 15 years, the most unjust aspect of all of this is that we've known the science and the impacts for at least the last 20 years. We've known what the risks are, we've known what needs to happen, but those in power have refused to act fast enough or deeply enough, um, often at the behest of vested interests, whether that's powerful fossil fuel lobby or other vested interests. So global emissions hit an all-time high in 2018. Having plateaued between 2014 to 2016, they've been rising alarmingly since then. This World Meteorological Organization report issued just yesterday reports that greenhouse gas emissions between 2015 and 2019 grew by 20% compared to the previous five-year period. And what's really noticeable about that period is it happened after the signing of the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement was signed in, in 2015, and while it doesn't come into effect until 2020, it's still really alarming that in the intervening number of years, emissions have um, escalated and, and continued to grow. And this growth is largely due to continued burning of fossil fuels. They're up by 4.7% in China, they're up by 2.5% in the US. The biggest, five biggest emitters globally are China, the US, Russia, Germany, Canada and Saudi Arabia. But if you take the European Union as a whole, we're the third biggest polluter, responsible for 10% of global emissions. So despite knowing what the problems are, despite knowing what the solutions are, we are on a path to a three degrees plus world, even if we implement all of our commitments under the Paris Agreement, which in 2015 uh, agreed the aim to keep temperatures to 1.5 degrees or at, at, at absolute maximum two, point, or two degrees gro growth. We have a really small window of time to avert the worst impact. We must have emissions in the next decade, and we must let to net zero well before 2050. The UN Secretary General, um, Antonio Guterres, has recognized this in calling today's UN summit. The explicit purpose of today is to challenge world leaders to up the ambition of what we aim to do to tackle climate change. And I'm looking forward, as I'm sure many of you are, to seeing what the results of today will be. 
So in terms of Ireland and our own Taoiseach is there today, we are way off track for meeting our climate targets for both 2020 and 2030, which were set at minus 20 and minus 30% respectively. And I'm sure we'll hear a lot more of this from, from Sive in, in her input. On latest figures, our emissions grew by 6.4% over the past three years. There has been a significant shift, I think, in, in, the, in the policy atmosphere in Ireland. The Citizens' Assembly was a hugely powerful moment. The cross-party work of a Dáil Committee on Climate Action, which took many of the recommendations of the Citizens' Assembly, and many of which then found their way into uh, Minister Bruton's Climate Action Plan published earlier this year. Now, while there's many faults and, and problems with it, which I'm sure we'll be teasing out across the panel, um, it does include some positive commitments to carbon budgeting, to enshrining the 2050 targets in law, and to strengthen governance elements of how we um, how we make policy and hold ourselves accountable to climate policy here in Ireland. But at the same time, uh, we've also seen hugely disappointing inconsistencies with Irish policy. So we've continued to grant licences for fossil fuel exploration. We've blocked progressive measures such as the Climate Emergencies Bill, even when it enjoyed a, a, a majority in the Dáil. We're one of, the few, one of a number of EU countries who are not supporting or haven't supported the European Commission to increase its ambition um, for its 2030 reduction target up to 55%. We're hopeful that that's one of the things that the Taoiseach might um, change his mind on today at the summit. So while he's there, um, he'll be speaking at today's summit and we might expect some step up on ambition. Ireland really has a very long way to go if we're to stop being a climate laggard and not even become a climate leader, but begin to do the bare minimum that our targets require of us. So some reflections on climate activism. Just a few. Firstly, I think it is really easy to get overwhelmed and to feel despairing. The closer you get to the science, the, the more you experience or hear about the kind of impacts that many people are facing and that we ourselves are facing. Um, but I think what's clear is that the one thing that despair shares with climate denial or climate indifference is that it can lead to inaction. So as climate activists, we need to encourage action, and that requires hope. Um, I think the energy, the enthusiasm, the joy um, many of us might have experienced during Friday's strikes is really heartening and it's really revitalising for those of us who've been active in this area for a number of years. And the reality is that we, we're going to be in this for the long haul. Um, so sustaining that hope and that energy and not getting burned out is going to be critical. A second reflection. There are many different axes to the climate movement. So there's individual action, all of the things that we might do in our own lives, such as recycling, lifestyle changes, how we travel, etc., versus government action, the policies and legislative um, processes, the investments that government might make. That's one axis. Another for movements is insider tactics, you know, the degree to which we engage with the political processes versus more outside mobilization, the feet on the street, the direct action. Another axis global level agreements such as the summit that we're seeing today or the, the UN um, Framework Convention on Climate Change talks that happen annually versus locally based initiatives and solutions. And some commentators I think can turn these kind of axes into either or. There's the potential for I suppose division along some of these lines. But the reality is that the challenge of climate change is so great that we need to fight on all of these fronts at all times. So different activists will be drawn for whatever reason to different approaches or different areas of interest. And I think what's really important is that there's diversity in that strength and we need to embrace it. I mean there's strength in that diversity and we need to embrace it. My final reflection on, on activism um, is that as climate activists, as climate justice activists, we must be calling not just for a greener future but a greener and fairer future. It's possible to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in ways that harm biodiversity, for example, by planting mass monoculture trees rather than um, local varieties, and I think Eddie might be picking up on some of those issues. It's possible to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in ways that threaten human rights rather than support them. Human rights defenders around the world are at the forefront of some of these um, conflicts. So in 2018, three quarters of the 
321 activists who were killed were do did so defending indigenous land and environmental rights. And while many of these in the past might have been associated with extractive industries, fossil fuel industries, some of the projects um, that human rights defenders are, are trying to defend their land or their res natural resources against also include um, renewable energies as well. So we need to learn those lessons of protecting human rights. And the final one here, I suppose it's also possible to reduce greenhouse gases in ways that increase poverty and inequality. And I think Sergio is also going to touch on, on some of those issues. And this is why ensuring social and environmental safeguards, taking a just transition approach, taking a climate justice approach is so critical. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I wish I could say I'm excited to be here, but I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> this is a little too much. Just a while ago, I was just getting here, and now here I am standing in front of all of you being given an opportunity to speak and share something. As much as it is overwhelming for me, I think it is uh, a very good opportunity and a chance to speak probably on behalf of uh, the rural communities out there who can't be here or who can't have any means of trying to speak for, their, for themselves. Um, in the first place, I thought of putting up a few pictures to help everyone look at this subject in the eyes of um, the rural uh, farmer or the smallholder farmer. I've worked with smallholder farmers for about six years now. And um, in those six years, I must say, I have lived in communities very close to them. So I see what they go through. Sometimes I feel it too when you're that close. So first of all, the subject of climate justice, I think um, in the first place is something I can say, the topic itself has been under communicated to the smallholder farmers. If today you go out there and ask one or two of them what they know about climate justice, if one of them gets to tell you something, that would be a very good plus. The chances are that all of them have no idea what you're talking about. Later on, the issue of climate change, there's been some issues of communication when it comes to the subject as well. Most smallholder farmers, if you ask them today what climate change is, to them, in simple terms, it's just a change in time. I don't know if that's the same thing or just close to the real thing. So for them, times have just changed. And how they've changed, it's just on its own, naturally. That's the belief. But later in the uh, course of days, as days move, messages have come through and various activists have come on board to communicate the aspect and the subject to them. But unfortunately, some information may have been left out. So the real cause, therefore, was told to them to say, the times have changed according to what they understand it to be. Climate change is just changing time to them. So times have changed, and the reason is because they are cutting down trees. So they have been made to believe the climate has changed because they cut down trees to try and maybe prepare a meal for themselves so they can't sleep on a hungry stomach. But they don't have any other means of preparing their meal. That's where the challenge comes in. How do they survive so that this talk of climate change being put on their head stops? They have no other ways. So this change in time has been characterized with different aspects. You've seen uh, we've experienced failure in crops, different crops, nothing has been spared. The fruit crops, the vegetable crops, everything. Back in the days, uh, farmers had this ability to tell that if I plant my crop now, the rains will come on such a date 
and microbes will germinate and I'll have a good yield. Up to today, I can tell you that there are some farmers who still plant their seed based on that belief because they have so much faith in the environment, in the weather system, even if it has changed. So they still do that. They will plant their crop, their seed, way before the rains come, but they're so hopeful that it's going to come and it doesn't show up. The seed just fails to germinate and just ferments and rots in the soil. Again, the reason will have to be it is their fault. So I decided to put up a few pictures. So one of those, the picture you're seeing now is a, f a, a field of maize. Some of you may know it as corn, but we call it maize back home. I'm sure that's a familiar term even here. I've, I've heard it a lot in, in lectures and all those. Uh, this farmer has almost consistently had yielded a lot of uh, uh, maize. <laughs> Sorry. So last year he planted his crop and imagine in the good years he's had to yield about 55 tons and last year he got nothing. There was a prolonged dry spell of over one month at the wrong time. And that, what you're seeing there is soybean. Farmers gathered just to have a look of what the effect has been on their crop. <coughs> Outbreaks, different pests have shown up in farmers' fields from nowhere. And that is a bucket of a mixture of uh, the four armyworm as well as the soybean looper. 17 of those buckets were harvested from a field of soybeans. And that is a maize field which has failed because of water stress. There was no rain. The crop germinated, but right before it could flower, there was no rain. At the end of the day, everything else leads to that. The security of food is under attack. It could have been at risk, but climate change has launched war on food security among the rural households of smallholder farmers. So they are saying, you've told us climate change has changed because we've done this and that. And at the end of the day, they come in and say, you can do this so that you can change things. I can assure you that whatever interventions that have been brought on board to say this can happen or this can help the situation, farmers have gladly accepted and have done it. They have gone on to reduce uh, tillage in their lands because they've been told minimum tillage will help and they don't over till the land anymore. They're doing their part. In other fields, you find they've been told to plant trees in the midst of their crops. So there are certain tree species that they've been advised to do. They are doing that. You find fields with tree species among them just to try and see if this can help the situation. But the question is, is everyone else doing the same? Maybe that can be a point of reflection. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and gender non-confirming persons. I come from a very beautiful place in, it's called Cape Town in the Republic of South Africa. And from mid-2017, Cape Town looked set to become the first city in the world to run out of drinking water. With the pollution of, with the population of over four million people, the city's dam levels kept falling below 30% with an incredibly dry summer. People literally prayed and, we, we used to believe that if you go to the mountains and you kneel and you pray, rain will come. It never happened. The city did not have enough rainfall from 2015, and so water restrictions had to be in place. The government launched a campaign, and they termed it Day Zero, to stress the urgency of the situation. 
official communication from the city of Cape Town was that they would switch off what the water supply and start rationing water for about over four million people. Now, if you tell a, uh, an ordinary person that their water supply, when they switch on the tap, there'll be no water on a certain given day, that tells you how urgent it is, and for a lot of people responded positively to that. Millions would have to queue for their daily water allowance at uh, designated water collection points that would be guarded by the military and the police. South Africa has a lot of uh, criminal activity already as it is. So if you're taking away police and military, uh, uh, the army, to go and uh, look after water, then you know how bad the situation is. Cape, Towns, Cape Townians were told not to bathe. Take two minute showers if you need to. Um, if you can save that water that you just used for a two minute shower, use it to flush the toilet. And generally, uh, the population obeyed the restrictions imposed by the government and adopted those uh, ideas. So when people were told not to bath, a lot of Cape Townians didn't bath every day. Um, they didn't shower for about 10 minutes. That started from 2017 right up to 2018. So for about a year, if you visited Cape Town, you would have known about that. I remember telling my little brother to get uh, drums and fill them up with water. I even told them where to get the drums. And if the situation doesn't improve, you could move to the Eastern Cape. They also had a drought, but it was better than Cape Town. They still had some water in some of the cities in the Eastern Cape. The response by the state may seem laudable on the surface because they did stress, the, the, the communication was very good. It, it got a lot of people thinking about climate change. It got a lot of people thinking about water. Um, and ma majority of the people obeyed whatever the state was telling them to do. Uh, there was a minority that wasn't. While, they were telling, uh, while the government was telling residents not to bath, they conveniently co forgot to tell them that there is a nuclear power right about 30 kilometers away from the city of Cape Town. And that used, for over 30 years, that nuclear power station has used portable water. During the crisis, the state-owned power utility released a statement announcing that they will save 22 billion liters of water annually as they have a desalination program that they are launching that would use water from the ground and water from the ocean. If they, were, they are going to save 30, 22 billion liters of water annually, which accounts to about 35% of their usage, you can imagine just how much water they are wasting in that power station. Not to mention that they received approval from the Department of uh, Environmental Affairs and, and Development Planning for a new power station right next to the, other, the only existing power station in Africa. The nuclear power station was not the only corporate culprit. The South African breweries, which, which was the third largest brewer in the world in 2016 when it was sold, also uses water from the mountains. It's the purest water. You don't need to boil it or anything. You can get it from the mountain and you drink it. They use it to make beer. The municipal council did not target any of these corporations. They told ordinary people not to bath. The truth is Cape Town would not have experienced the crisis if water was managed properly. Yes, there was a drought, but there was enough water to actually drink. It was just being misused. If there is a drought, clearly there is a lot of sunshine. Instead of approving the construction of a nuclear power station, you could have approved the construction of a solar power station. If you have money to build a nuclear power station, clearly you have money to build a solar power station as well. And activists who campaign against uh, nuclear power, mining, deforestation, and the like in the global south are targeted by business, which is clearly in cahoots with the state, from Brazil, Kenya, in South Africa. When villagers in Kolobeni in the Eastern Cape of the Republic of South Africa campaigned against proposed mining in their village, activists were assassinated. The chairperson of the local co committee was murdered. Another who also served in, the, in that committee was also murdered. The state turned a blind eye and pushed ahead with the plans to start mining in the in the, and the villagers received enough public support to be able to take the state to court and won consent. The court said, you cannot go and do uh, and approve mining if the local people who live in that area do not approve of your plans. But the state keeps pushing 
for that community to start mining because they have enough kickbacks from the Australian mining company that will be mining in their community. We've seen mining devastate a lot of communities in South Africa from uh, Gauteng province where a lot of the mining happens and now they are expanding it to other provinces and a lot, there is a lot of resistance. Now when, when climate change happens, in when, uh, as you already said, it affects a lot of people who are poor, who are marginalized in villages. Wherever you are in the global south, you will see it. It's indigenous communities who depend on that land for their livelihoods. When you approve uh, a mining company to go in and mine, you devastate that environment. You also take away their livelihoods. There was one uh, such community in Gauteng where the radiation was so high that if, if it was a nuclear power station, it would have been evacuated. But there are people who live there. So when things like that happen, when activists are being targeted, they flee. And when they flee, they become refugees. If they seek protection elsewhere, they become refugees. And when natural disaster strikes, like it did in the Bahamas, people got on boats, they were heading to the US. How did the US respond? Trump does not want any refugees there. So climate justice also challenges how we respond to human beings on the move because of that crisis. And we need politicians and corporations who, are, who take responsibility for that. One of the questions was whose responsibility is it? If the state is in cahoots with the uh, corporations, we need to take them on. Uh, and we need to get politicians out of office if they are the ones who are, are complicit. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to come. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. And it's lovely to see a packed room, standing room only. Um, a few years ago, that was uh, a, just a dream for us climate activists to have such interest in what was such a, an important issue even back then. And what I love as well is just seeing the posters from last Friday around, because even though we're all pretty much adults here in the room, we have to remember that the future of the young people who are at home eating their dinners and doing their homework is what this is all about. Uh, they've already grown up in a, an atmosphere that is um, maybe, you know, 100 or more parts per million more CO2 in it than, than should be the case. And they are going to suffer the effects of climate change. And we must remember that it's the people who are not in the room, the people who are not in the conversation that need to be remembered because it's going to affect all of us. Uh, but some people are going to be affected even more than others. And this is the dilemma, I suppose, when we start thinking about climate justice. So amongst other things, I teach environmental politics at UCD. And one of the first things I ask the students to read is an article by Bill McKibben called Winning Slowly is the Same as Losing. And the reason I ask them to read this article is because when we're talking about climate change, it's a totally different class of environmental problems. It's a problem that's generated by physics, if you like. It, you can't fight gravity and you can't fight the effect of greenhouse gas emissions when they go into the atmosphere. Cumulative greenhouse gas emissions have a linear effect, if you like, on global temperature. And global temperature rise is what is going to lead to climate change. It's great to see Alastair McKinstry back there. He's one of the Green Party councillors and he's a climate scientist. And uh, it's just quite extraordinary, you know, to see so many scientists now entering into the political arena because clearly the uh, political community has not been paying sufficient attention to the messages they have been giving for the last 30 and 40 years. So the students read this article, winning slowly is the same as losing. And what do we mean by that? We mean that incrementalism is almost as bad as doing nothing at all. So what we're looking at is a situation where global greenhouse gas emissions have nearly doubled since 1988, since the very year that the IPCC was established. So instead of committing themselves and then acting uh, on their commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and keep temperatures below two degrees, we're now facing into a world of climate and ecological crisis that I didn't even imagine that I would live through myself, but it looks increasingly likely that some of those severe effects will, will come um, um, you know, very soon. In some cases, they're happening already around the world. 
But what is important to remember is that the international arena is, is, is complicated. It takes a long time to get treaties signed. It takes a long time to make progress at international level. And the Paris Agreement is flawed in the sense that there isn't any kind of major enforcement mechanism. There isn't any obligation on governments uh, to bring their emissions down below what they are voluntarily committing to. So in a sense, it's up to us at domestic level to ensure in, de in developed countries for precisely the reasons that um, Neve has outlined, um, to ensure that we hold our governments to account for the commitments they have made at international fora. So going back to um, not even the last IPCC assessment report, but the one before that, AR4, the Irish government, along with the other governments in the European Union, recognised the severity of climate change and the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by somewhere between 25 and 40 percent below their 1990 level by 2020. So they recognised this back in 2014. And this was a commitment signed off by our government on our behalf uh, at the IPCC. Now, subsequently, the Irish policy process uh, produced a climate act. We signed the Paris Agreement. We then produced a national mitigation plan that, in our view, in Friends of the Irish Environment, was completely at odds with the advice that the scientists had given and that the Irish government had accepted. So the National Mitigation Plan that was adopted in 2017 does not put us back on a course where we will meet our 2020 or 2030 targets. We're still way off course and there's still a kind of political blockage in implementing policies that will reduce uh, emissions. Now when we say reduce emissions, it sounds so abstract. What are we talking about? We're talking about public transport. We're talking about promoting cycling and walking and making our towns, cities and villages livable and walkable. Compact, sustainable development. No more sprawl. Ending our reliance on motorways and fast travel, if you like, aviation and so on, and relying on slower ways of travelling that have less impact on the environment and thus less emissions. We're talking about switching to forms of agriculture and food production that benefit people and nature, that protect habitats, that allow them to flourish, that store carbon permanently in woodlands, that generate protein you know, sustainably that for human consumption without generating uh, excessive emissions. And unfortunately, the agricultural model in Ireland is one that not only generates a third of our emissions, which is very high in a, in a European context, the European average is about 10%, a third of Irish emissions come from agriculture. And we really need to start having a conversation about what kind of model we need in order to bring emissions down to a level that is compatible with our commitments under the law. And that's a difficult conversation. I know Saoirse will address it because we are relying not just on um, flawed incentives, perverse subsidies, and a sort of an outdated idea about what farming means culturally, perhaps, that we, are, we have an attachment to a herd number, but we won't, uh, we're reluctant to get into forestry. And then the forestry itself is problematic because we're actually deforesting instead of planting permanent woodland. So we're losing carbon and we're damaging our bogs, which are also uh, stores of carbon as well. Now, I've gone a little bit over time, but I, I need to just address the, 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 the climate case. So arising out of these, uh, oh, this awareness, I suppose, that our government was not doing what it said it would do, Friends of the Irish Environment took a legal case uh, in the High Court, which was heard for four days last uh, February, or January, sorry, and um, we argued on the grounds of constitutional law and also administrative law that the plan that the government adopted was simply not fit for purpose. Now, unfortunately, we got a judgment on Thursday and the judge didn't agree with us that the plan was, um, was, was unlawful, so he was not prepared to quash it because he recognised that the law as it is provides a lot of discretion for the government to implement a variety of policies based on a political uh, choice, I suppose, of priorities. Um, but it did rec the court did recognise that we nonetheless had legal standing to take the case, and that's very significant because it means that there's a recognition in the law 
that it's important for individuals and organisations like, like Friends of the Irish Environment to actually challenge their governments, hold their governments to account in the courts and actually use litigation as a device for uh, enforcing environmental law. So there's lots of other cases I could point to. And while it seems as though this is another example of you know, losing is just another setback, sometimes it's important to remember that it's necessary to lose cases in order to get to the core issue that is holding us back. And I think personally that one of the core obstacles we're facing in Ireland is a really poor legislative framework that does not require the government to keep to any specific targeted greenhouse gas emission reductions. It doesn't require them to approach the carbon budgeting and uh, measures that would you know, put the emission reductions into shorter timescales um, that would commit, if you like, political parties to longer term objectives. And getting around those governance problems will be critical if we're going to make those bold decisions that will finally get us back in line with the Paris Agreement. Thank you. How are you? Um, I suppose I'm coming from a different place, like some of the other speakers. I'm a farmer from Leitrim. Um, so my introduction to activism is sort of forced. Um, so I'm, I'm coming from an affected community. So we've spent the last eight years fighting against the fossil fuel industry. So a little bit like the story about what happened in Rossport except that we were lucky, we were successful. Um, it took us six years to ban fracking, and that picture there is very important for us. In 2017, we managed to achieve legislation to make it illegal to, um, to force a fluid into a hole in Ireland for the purposes of extracting oil or gas. So that was a, I think that was probably one of the first huge wins for environmentalism in Ireland. And I think that it, 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 it showed that when we organize, that we can win. And I think that's what's changing now. And that's why people know that we need, need to win, but they can see that they can win. So that puts an enormous responsibility on us as, as individuals and as people who organize locally, that we have to take responsibility for climate change and for climate action and for if, if we're not happy with what's happening in our government, in a place like Ireland, we can change that. Um, if I lived in Africa, I'm sure I'd be, I, I think I'd have been poisoned at this stage. I don't think I'd be alive. And um, that hasn't happened yet. And, you know, in the beginning, we were really scared of the oil and gas industry. And we didn't think it was safe to take on the oil and gas industry. But we have proved that we can take on these industries and win and survive. Um, now, so at the end of that period, um, we felt the enormous responsibility to continue. So, because after six years of activism, you, you know, you're going to learn something. So in the beginning, um, our introduction to activism was concerned about public health. We were listening to people in America who were experiencing the effects of fracking, and we were listening to the stories that they were telling about people being sick. Now, by now, a lot of research has been done to show that and to prove that and to make that um, accepted. But at the time, back in 2011, when we were hearing those stories, the industry was telling a different story. So now we continue our activism. And now we fight for things like um, for on, on climate change, Particularly, we, we, we think about the people in America who are still experiencing fracking, and we, we fight against um, US frack gas imports. Um, after people in Leitrim realized that they could take on the uh, fossil fuel industry and win, they turned around and they looked at the, for, at the timber industry. And we already have 20% of our county covered in, a lot of it in Sicca Spruce, and we said, you know, we, first of all, we considered our responsibility to climate change. And then we looked at, so we started to look at that. 
and we started to see our schools close and we started to talk about things like equity and climate action. And we knew that we had become a sacrifice zone for the fossil fuel industry when the government wanted to frack our area. But now we're still concerned that we could still be a sacrifice zone for the timber industry. So we're, we're, I'm also working in a campaign. Let's show you the people. Um, these are some of the people from the Save Leitrim um, campaign. So we're, we're also taking responsibility. I think that's something that's very important. So we're going to look at forestry in Leitrim and we're going to say, what is it actually doing in terms of climate action? So what, are, what about all this clear felling? Are we actually producing emissions or are we sequestering carbon? What about our bogs? What about our soils? Um, by draining our bogs and planting Sitka spruce, is that a climate action? And I think that what's been missing in that area, again, is people. People need to participate. People need to challenge. We, we have to stop expecting others to do the research. Ordinary people can read reports. Ordinary people can um, take action and can change. In a democracy, we have a huge responsibility. So um, one of the things that we've recognized in Leitrim is that we are playing our part in Leitrim with 20% of our county covered in trees. Well, we would like to see those existing areas, we would like to see that they were actually being used for sequestering carbon. And um, we will take responsibility and make the changes in our county development plan to make that happen. And now we understand how that works. Um, Leo Varadkar today has made a statement at the, at the UN saying that he's going to um, phase out oil exploration off the coast. Um, that is the beginning of a negotiation with this government. The, the people of this country and the children of this country came out and took a stand this weekend and before. And we have a, that was the first offer. The next thing that we'd like to see is we'd like to see Fianna Fáil come out and take a stand and say that we won't have US frack gas in our energy mix. Because we know that when we go to electricity, to run our trains, to run electric cars, to run data centers in the future, which could take 30% of our energy, we know that we can't have that. That can't be from frack gas in America. Our renewables at the moment don't look like they can keep up with electrical demand. But we need to make sure that we have a choice in our energy mix. And I hope that Fianna Fáil will help us challenge that by supporting a motion that Bridge Smith is bringing forward next week. Um, I just want to say that our kids organised, with other kids, a strike in the school um, last week. They didn't tell the teachers. Uh, maybe that was because we were in Leitrim and we just wanted to have a real action. Um, it was amazing to see the kids going out with all of their anxiety and the fear of the principal and of the teachers and taking a stand and being told to go back and standing their ground and then to see the teachers go in and bring all the other kids out. The respect that I have for those kids, they learned how to stand up to authority and they won, they had a little victory. And I hope that the negotiations have begun now with Leo Varadkar, and I hope that the people continue to stand up until we get everything that we need. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, first of all, thanks for having me and fair play to the musicians. You're stuck here for the, the whole talk. Um, so I suppose I, I still struggle with calling myself an activist. It feels like a, a real kind of, you have to do this, this and this to be one. But saying I am, so let's imagine I am, I'm an activist. Um, the most important thing I've found, because you can, you can go to protests, you can write letters, you can write articles, you can lobby your politicians, you can run to be a politician, but the most constant, and for me the hardest thing you do as an activist is what you talk about, is every conversation. You know, you're sitting in those conversations, you're like, oh, will I let that pass? Or will I roll up my sleeves and 
talk, and which I always like talking about, is will I talk about capitalism? Because, and I will, spoiler, um, it is still not talked about proportionate to the effect it has on every single thing we do. So a lot of the problems I found with it is this kind of internalization of, oh, this is a bit radical to talk about. You'll sound like a crusty hippie. You'll sound like, you know, you, oh, you don't understand. You know, you have all these real smug people being like, oh, you know, I was uh, anti-capitalist when I was 20 and then I grew up. And you're like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Um, but we internalize that and I internalize that and I still, you know, I've let conversations pass, pass me and afterwards I'm like, oh yeah, I, I, that's capitalism by the way. Just, you know, we should talk about this. Um, because we don't talk about it, but enormous corporations talk about it and billionaires talk about it. And this system is not an accident. You know, it sits there and it's maintained and it's curated and it is violently maintained in a lot of the world. Um, and in Ireland especially, and I, I don't know how long this has been going on, um, but there's been like an invisibilization of ideology. So if you say, oh, let's talk about socialism or let's talk about not capitalism, it's, oh yeah, that's radical. Let's just talk in these kind of nebulous terms about the good of Ireland and jobs and prosperity, none of which are you know, exclusive to capitalism. Um, but there's almost this uh, ideology-free form of politics we have, which is ridiculous. Um, and I, maybe, maybe not everyone has internalized that, but I know myself, I shrink from being that person in the room that talks about capitalism. And I think it's really important to talk about it because you know, a, a, f a friend, well, a man I know, um, said to me before, oh, it's all very well to be anti-capitalist, but you don't even have to say that. You can just, you know, talk about a sharing economy or this, that, and the other, and that's fine. And we've all been in those lovely cafes that are non-capitalist, and we've all been to that cute bookshop. But without saying it, it doesn't explain to people like my mum who said, but what else is there? That these are not just cutesy little bookshop where you also get coffee and whatever, they're presenting an alternative and they're presenting a structural critique of what's wrong with so many things. Um, and I, I think where activism can fail is we're all fighting these battles, whatever one we choose, be it climate justice, be it racial justice, be it gender, be it labor, labor rights. And sometimes you feel like, oh, I can't take on something else. You know, you're exhausted in yourself. But oftentimes, if you just look at what you're fighting for, be it oceans or if you're talking about plastic or agriculture, capitalism is already there. And in talking about it more freely, all of us, we can share some of that emotional work and we can support other activists in other areas, whereas sometimes we can we can be quite you know um, isolated in our own kind of silos. And my uncle once told me he said, um, "People like you and me, our job is to open up conversation, to say what's not being said, and not in like some kind of edge lordy kind of way, but just." Just say it, because oftentimes people are like, oh yeah, no, I, I agree. You know, I should have said that, but we're, we've just self-silenced ourselves over this. And the conversation is changing. Like, there are some people who have done absolutely Trojan work with our Overton window. We have, now, I know there's loads to criticise them about, but Bernie Sanders is a one-man machine in terms of persisting with the message and not letting that window slip ever further to the right. He, I just think he's brilliant for that. Um, and I think we will never achieve climate justice. We'll never be able to talk about reparations. We'll never be able to talk about 
finally achieving you know racial justice we'll never be able to talk about animal liberation we'll never be able to talk about all of these things until we have addressed the enormous elephant in the room which is our economic system and not addressing our economic system is not common sense it is the very opposite of common sense um, and I don't know how we're ever going to move towards our like you know post-capitalist anarchist socialist utopia without talking about it and without saying okay what do we want and you know another you know another group that's doing Trojan work I think is Labour in England I, they were on fire today releasing policies um, but it's up to all of us and it's up to all of us to not let those conversations pass us because oftentimes when you say it people are like oh, yeah, I know that too and we're just not talking about it and we'll need to if we are to you know, face into climate breakdown, um, the bits we can't avoid now, if we're to be involved with shaping and designing what comes next. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for all of those really powerful, so different, brilliant presentations. And um, that brings us to our questions and answers session, which I'm sure a lot of you are looking forward to. It's 20 past seven. So I think we have max 15 minutes. We'll aim for 10. Depending on how we go, we might give it 15. There are six seats at the top, and I do implore six of you to come up and sit down after standing there for so long at the back. Um, we have two people with roving mics. Do we? Yes, we do. So I think we'll just go for it. We'll take each question and answer it as it comes. Please, if you can, seeing as there's so many people, do keep it short and please ask a question. Thanks. And this is being live streamed. Thanks so much. That's a great um, reminder, Korma. This is being live streamed. Um, please feel free to identify yourself or not. Um, and when I say please do ask a question, I just mean make sure there is a question rather than a statement. Hi, my name is Rose Foley, and I live uh, near Oranmore. I'm thinking of holding a climate talk next week at Oranmore Library, and I'm just wondering, <laughs> what do I do to... Um, try to bring as many people to, to the meeting and what do I tell them? What I, I want to give them statistics, I want to give them facts, but I also want to let them know what can be done in Ireland, what should we do? Should we write to the politicians? Should we write letters to the uh, media? Uh, does anyone have any advice about what to do next? I just realized we'll need one of our mics to be up here for the speakers. Thanks, Cassie. And then one down there. Anyone like to answer that? Thanks, Zach. I love that question. Uh, it's also daunting, you know, and, and don't, don't, don't feel that you have to solve everything from your living room or your local library. Um, I recommend, um, I can't remember the name of the organization, but it's Tara Shine's group. Does anybody remember the name of it? Something for change, 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 change by degrees, change by degrees. So they started, um, they were concerned about the local, the global, the local, the everything, but they started on plastics and they set up a campaign to take Kinsale plastic free. But she has an amazing slideshow all about how they, they worked with very small uh, ambitions, you know, small practical realizable goals in a small area, brought more and more people involved and then connect slowly outwards to the bigger, wider issues. And it, it, it's a very replicable model everybody could do what, what they did in, in Kinsale. And I think it's a lot less scary and a lot more fun to take on a kind of local campaign like that. And you know, kids particularly get the plastic, they get the oceans, they get the sort of tangible stuff. It's very hard to communicate and get across climate you know, policy, that kind of abstract level stuff. So you start with practical things and educate yourselves, educate yourselves, inform yourselves, get your kids out striking, <laughs> such a brilliant example. But you know, it's very empowering, but we, we have to sort of start where we are and not be afraid to start. Thanks, Sive. Um, the next question. Hi, um, 
You might have seen in the last few days about the Tala wetlands being destroyed in Dublin. They have been completely flattened and just like they're, they're gone now basically and they've been a protected area for, for a number of years. So I just sometimes feel like, do you think that sometimes our government at different levels, local and national, they're actively working against the climate sometimes and like how do we hold them accountable and is there any kind of like legal redress that we can, can go down to say like, well, you're actually complicit in the destruction of our environment, n never mind not reaching your targets? That's a great question. I think the answer is yes, we will hold them to account. And the law is evolving, as are the litigants. <laughs> so get involved, get in touch with some organisations, get in touch with myself or Eddie or some of the others here. And, uh, and don't be afraid to talk to lawyers about taking a case. It can be complicated, difficult, but not impossible. Can I just say that what you, the question you've asked is actually the question that every campaign ends up asking. How did this happen? This shouldn't have happened. How, therefore, did it happen? And we were like that in, in Leitrim, trying to figure out what the hell is going on. How come this company have arrived and they want to do this terrible thing and they're saying that they were invited by the government and that it's all in the public interest? we really have to start to, to think about how decisions are made. So we have to look at how policy, most of the, a lot of the stuff that's doing a harm is where there's an absence of policy. And that the reason, there's a very good reason for absence in, in policy, and it's to do with environmental law. If you have a policy in relation to, we'll say, for example, energy, then you must have a plan. So if, you know, there's a, load, a lot of potential to do damage. So if you have a policy to, to, to follow, then you should have a plan and a program, and that sets out what you're going to do and what your plans are, and then that can be assessed. So you can look at all the alternatives to the plan, and people can consult and inform themselves, and lots of people can participate in the development of that policy. Okay? Now, that doesn't happen in Ireland. What we do in Ireland is we deliberately avoid having policies like you're talking about the mitigation plan and the adaption plans. They didn't even, when they were screened for SEA, I don't think they even required SEA. They were so, there was such, there was such little, there was nothing in them. So what needs to happen, what happens in Ireland is that we end up without policy, we end up with companies coming forward with projects that aren't supported by policy and they get, they get, a, they get assessed at a low level through an environmental impact assessment, which doesn't look at the high stuff at all. And that is what I'm hoping. Like, the people who are doing the Trojan work here is, is side beside me in Friends of the Irish Environment. And we need to challenge those types of... That, sometimes I feel that that can be a little bit technical for, for me. But what it's really talking about is it's, a, it's the corruption in decision making. And, and that's what you've talked about there. And it's the first question that you end up with when you realise, how could this go wrong? And the answer is corruption. Did you want to? One, one of the most important things to do as an activist is to never underestimate the impact of your little actions that you do um, in your local community. When the people in Kolobeni were faced with assassinations and they were challenging a multi-billion uh, dollar company, uh, and the state, the South African government, they took them to court and they won in court and they didn't just win for themselves, they won it for other communities as well. So it shaped land use uh, regulations in South Africa. If you need to go in and do anything on land, you need to get consent of the community that, uh, that lives that will be affected by that land. So never underestimate the little things that you can do in your local area. Thank you. Anybody else with a question? Yeah, Maeve um, Donica here from the law school. I just, um, one of the issues that strikes me from what Saif said is, and it's an important one in light of the case of last week, is the lack of robustness in the legislative framework. And the man from Leitrim, I think, has also pointed out very clearly how that needs to be corrected in order for at least the policy level to support the kind of actions that people who are concerned about the environment wish to have supported. And one of the things that strikes me in the run-up to the next election, you know, all eyes will be on the Green Party because you know, it's clear that the Green Party is going to enjoy a certain resurgence in support. But on their own, they will get little more than incrementalism from the larger parties. 
And drawing again on Saif's comment about incrementalism being worse than doing nothing, I think it was Saif who said that. I think that one of the, the tactics in the broad left or center left should be that the parties that are likely to go into coalition with the larger parties are likely to support a government ought to agree a common platform on what is the minimum that they will settle for in relation to the environment. There's absolutely no point in entering into negotiations afterwards and the Green Party should remember what happened the last time they went into coalition and didn't really understand what they were doing uh, in terms of the, the bargaining position of the smaller party. If they come to an understanding with other small parties and like-minded independents, they could have a considerable power after the next election to force the hand of either Fianna Fáil or Fine Gael in relation to you know, making the legislative framework more robust. That on its own will not change everything or possibly even not enough, but it will assist considerably in getting things right, especially when it comes to enforcement. And I think that is a political conversation which simply must happen in the broad left and actually would be to the electoral benefit of the broad left in the general election that will come. Do you agree? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Should I be saying anything about this? I'll get in awful trouble. Um, oh, this has been live streamed, isn't it? Oh, yeah. No, you can feel free to. No, uh, I think you're right. And I think that those, like, obviously, I personally even look at coalition. First off, any coalition is voted on by all the members, um, a program for government. And. <laughs> Like, I can't see how coalition with any party who positions itself as a neoliberal party can be reconciled with environmentalism. Um, like, they just have, they've come up against each other now and it's, it's kind of a fight for the soul of humanity. Um, and so I would like to, like, you know, uh, many people talk about left unity. I'd love to see it. Um, there's the new Simpsons fan page political party, if anyone's seen that. Um, I was thinking, geez, wouldn't that be great if that actually took hold and could bring different parties on the left together? Because I do think any coalition should be um, policy-based. But the red lines I would have would also include, you know, not just um, robust legislature, but things like abolish direct provision. I think it would have to be done. Um, you know, Mass I have done, what's it, five years now worth of campaigning um, on that. And I know, was it David Norris had a bill there four years ago? Was it for ab an abolish direct provision bill? Um, and that failed. But, you know, that would have to be one of them. Um, there would have to be you know, you'd have to have some sort of homelessness red line in it as well. I, I don't think it would just fall down to environmentalism. So there's a large spectrum within the party. I think I fall further towards the, let's just have a big left unity and all take over as opposed to let's, you know, become a fig leaf for Fianna Fáil or Fine Gael. Um, but I think every programme for government does have red lines. I don't know who draws them up, actually, maybe... Would you even know? Oh well, yeah, I don't know. If I just submit my red lines, but I, I do think you're totally right. I think lessons do need to be learned, and there needs to be strong green red lines. Um, that's what I think. Thanks, Sirsha. Um I know that Neve has a comment on that. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, I mean, I just feel we need to get beyond the party politics. We're talking about an existential crisis. And I think as activists, our ambition has to be that the minimum level of environmental action has to be at the heart of all parties. And I think it's really interesting reflecting, I guess, on, I suppose, the broader, the broader democratic context. So in the context of a, 
a minority government, we have seen such successes as, as the fracking bill, as the fossil fuel divestment bill, and a couple of others. But they are in the minority because, unfortunately, um, I suppose the, the, the current government has used quite a technical mechanism, the, the money message, to block a huge number of bills. So we are in a situation, we live in a democracy, the majority of our um, elected representatives have got behind and supported a number of other bills that um, have progressive, um, progressive across the spectrum, but particularly in relation to climate, progressive um, climate emergencies bill, for example, that are currently blocked. So I think we, it, 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 uh, your question on, I suppose, the, the um, how we work with the parties in the future election is one, but I think it's also how we look at our political system also, and that we ensure that if there's a, I suppose, a, a democratic mandate um, for a certain action, that that can be allowed to be taken forward. And I think we do need to look at the, the money message currently. Okay, so I've, yeah. Thank you, Neve. Yeah, sorry, I don't wish to, to hog it at all, but just to respond uh, directly to the question about governance, um, I think you're completely right about the, the poor governance framework, and it is welcome that the uh, Minister Bruton's All of Government Plan does commit to producing a new bill, strengthening that framework. Uh, but in the meantime, those of us who are litigants one day of the week are policy activists in another day of the week, and we're, some of us, uh, working for a few different parties, uh, including Independence for Change, Labour, Greens, and Fianna Fáil, actually, uh, working together to prepare a private member's bill, which will do precisely that. And our hope is to get it on the order paper before Christmas, so to get ahead of the government. And the, the, the judgment that we got last week clarifies, I think, exactly what we need to do. If, this is why losing can sometimes be good. We know what it is that's defective about the legislation, and we have an election coming up, so it's a good opportunity to get that kind of coalition together. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to know. It's a really huge question of political strategy. You know, These are difficult judgments we all have to make. Do we go for the big picture stuff and do we stick with our allies? Um, I'm a fan of the Sunrise Movement, which is the group in the Democratic Party that have been campaigning for the Green New Deal in the US. And they have a very simple slogan, which I think we should adopt, which is no permanent friends, no permanent enemies. If you think about that as you align with people strategically on given issues, uh, but you don't stay sort of stu stuck with, with your political allies, that you can move, and our movement needs to move and grow and shape the conversation and shape the way our allies develop their conversations. And we shouldn't rule out talking to anybody, but I'm speaking in a very general way, like political parties do have particular dilemmas, obviously. But, um, but the main thing is that we are at a key moment in the lead up to an election where we can exert influence. And it's all about your local candidates, your local people knocking on your door, what you tell them you want. And that is reflected in how they uh, make their decisions later on. Thank you very much, Saif. I'd like to move on now to our summing up by Dr. Suming Koo. Just before I do, I wonder, <laughs> is there anyone from the Environmental Society and NUIG who'd like to very briefly um, let us know what their actions are. Yeah, great. Um, hi everyone, um, my name is Aoife Donovan. Um, I'm a second year law student and recently I was elected as auditor for the Environmental Society. Um, I guess I'll really briefly just tell you what we did last year as an environmental society and what our plans are um, this year as a society. So last year, um, some of the main things we did was we hosted um, zero waste workshops. Um, we tried to cut down the use of single-use plastic here on campus. So um, in like the college bar and in our canteen, we tried to get rid of um, plastic straws and things like that, and we're working on getting um, compostable cups. Um, we also had a number of... Um, um, documentaries on show, so just to promote sustainability and all that, and just to kind of get the ball rolling, get a discussion started. Um, we also had um, um, potluck dinners, so we collabed with um, the Veg Sock and the Organic Gardening Society, and we had um, just events where we could have like vegetarian and vegan dinners and things like that. So just like you know, obviously we all know agriculture is a huge um, part of um, climate change, and we just kind of wanted to get that discussion going. Um, this year, as a society, we have some really big plans. Um, we've just um, elected our new committee, so we're all really excited to see what they bring to the table. Um, so some plans we have are obviously to continue reducing plastic on campus. We've um, heard about other uh, universities in Ireland who have um, zero, um, 
sorry, plastic free cafes. So we'd love to try to get something like that into NUAG if possible. Um, also, we want to keep going, obviously, the potluck dinners and documentaries and all that. Um, we are really involved in the climate strike there on Friday. It was great to see the turnout that we had. Um, we made posters and all that. Um, and yeah, I guess we kind of just want to s promote sustainability on campus. There's um, a talk on Thursday on fast fashion and how to reduce that. There's also um, a charity shop crawl. Um, and I think we're thinking of hosting like a clothes swap just to reduce down on fast fashion. Um, I think the main purpose of the Environmental Society is just to be a place where students can meet other like-minded people. Um, as someone mentioned earlier, um, climate change and this whole area, it can be quite overwhelming and people can quite often feel um, quite isolated and like they're not, it's hard to find people who think similarly. And um, so the Environmental Society is really an area um, where people can feel kind of a bit more supported on campus. Um, so yeah, um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what we discuss for the rest of the year and if there's any members or anyone who wants to be a member in the group, um, you can send us an email or you can sign up yourselves or whatever. So yeah, thank you. Thanks everyone for staying and um, I just want to say thank you very much to the Irish Centre for Human Rights and Maeve for organising this and to everybody for turning up all our speakers. So um, just a couple of minutes to talk about our, the Ryan Institute. I'm here um, deputising for Professor Charlie Spillane, who's director of the Ryan Institute, and I myself am the cluster leader for the uh, socio-economic impact cluster um, of the Institute. And this cluster represents 36 researchers, I think, at the moment within the Institute. Um, the Ryan Institute could be considered to be a powerhouse for interdisciplinary or cross-cutting research uh, to address the many different environmental and sustainable development challenges that, they are, that our society faces, um, both our national society and our global world society. And we call ourselves a cross-cutting or an interdisciplinary uh, research centre. But what this kind of collaboration with the our Centre for Human Rights, and with you all, the audience, the students, the activists. Um, this pushes the challenge to the Institute, and the researchers within the Institute, to move from being an interdisciplinary or cross-cutting centre to being a transdisciplinary centre, a centre that has transformative ambitions uh, in bringing our research to bring about change in society and to help that and support that. So we are um, a large institute. We have research groups from all colleges in the university. We have expertise spanning science, engineering, so you could socioeconomics, health sciences, and we bring together expertise from all the major disciplines that link science and people uh, within uh, the uh, Ryan Institute, my own cluster, the socioeconomic impact cluster. It's a small cluster. Uh, with the 36 researchers doing research connecting the three main areas of what we would call concern science or transformative science. These are uh, understanding planetary dynamics, um, uh, bringing about sustainable transitions in the way we live as human beings, and uh, thinking about global development issues. So at present, we're the largest research institute we have 92 research groups. Each of them is led by a principal investigator. We have 12 centers or clusters, and we are focused on these 14 themes here, the coastal and marine, the energy and climate change, um, agriculture and bioeconomy, and the environment and health. Now, all of these themes, it's not just the energy theme that has um, climate change in it. All of the themes are relevant to climate change. And um, uh, we're all of our researchers. I think we've around 470 researchers at present. Uh, we, these include 90 postdoctoral fellows, 50 research assistants, over 240 PhD students. And we are engaged in around 500 different funded projects. And this represents about a fifth of all the research income coming into the university. So I want you to think about this as a huge resource for activism, for community, and for society. Because the state 
and other multilateral agencies and governmental agencies and have invested hugely in all this research and um, expertise and getting the science together. Yeah. So uh, we are also involved in teaching. The Institute's affiliated with 20 different taught postgraduate programs, including the climate change, agriculture, and food security that Kaluba is participating in. Uh, but also with coastal and marine, energy systems, environment, society, and development, water resources, rural sustainability, sustainability, health economics, and all of these um, different taught programs draw on the research. And, and you can sort of see from the speakers we've had today how all the issues are connected. So we can't really think of any of the separate issues as really being separate. So... As a comprehensive environmental institute, we're engaged in research, but also in trying to think about what kinds of partnerships we can contribute to uh, to push forward on the sustainable development goals uh, and these global goals that we have responsibility nationally and internationally to work towards by 2030. Now, just thinking from even my own research, smaller research group within the Institute's point of view, how and today's topic and today's co-sponsoring with the Irish Centre for Human Rights, the National Centre for Human Rights Education, I just want to um, summarise, I suppose, by reflecting on a very important report by Philip Alston, the United Nations Spe uh, Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and climate change. And I think that it, fall, it, it recaps a lot of the different uh, points that have been shared um, around the panel and in the questions today um, to focus our thoughts on climate change as this unprecedented challenge to human rights. So this is my particular area of science, you could call it, is social science imp um, implications of human rights and how this affects um, society, societal norms, and policies. So, Philip Alston, as the UN expert on extreme poverty, has written this report to raise awareness about the importance of climate change as the unprecedented emergency. And his report to the Human Rights Council is mainly aimed at his own community of science, the human rights community, yeah, to point out that human rights is not doing enough to, and to issue a call to action. So in a minute, I'm going to issue a call to action for each of our panelists. And if you want to think about your one call for action, okay? But I just want to reflect on the call to action that Philip Alston has produced in producing this report to the Human Rights Council, because he argues that this is climate change is an existential challenge and that we need genuinely transformative change to restructure our societies and economies and our human rights regime in accordance with this existential challenge. So to human rights actors, he reminds us that what we need to do as human rights people and as social scientists like myself involved in applying human rights, we need to transcend our traditional techniques. We need to transcend our traditional academic and scholarly approaches. We need to become not only interdisciplinary, but transdisciplinary, to transcend our traditional uh, limited approaches and to engage with community activists, to build coalitions, to do human rights in a human rights way. And by this I mean involving people in meaningful participation and thinking about who benefits in terms of their fundamental rights. And to bring existing mechanisms back to life, whether these are political mechanisms, legal mechanisms, community mechanisms, or livelihood mechanisms. So all of these really uh, link to me, the speakers today, and our mission in the Institute to make our science matter and to make our science transformative. So the um, the call to action really is about how we could link what we do in the university as what we would bright, broadly call concerned science. Yeah? Finding the facts, uh, finding out and il illuminating the mechanisms, 
um, explaining what these are, helping us to understand the challenges, yeah, and the actions. So we have to think about the context, which is really that there has been an assault on science. Yeah, broadly, politically speaking, a political assault on science, on environmental science in particular, and on the urgency of the climate emergency in particular. So we do need to be robust about science, but we can no longer be content to do scientific research in an only descriptive and not action-focused way. Yeah? Because the climate may not care scientifically or objectively about our existence as humanity. But as concerned scientists, we should be concerned with what the conditions are for humanity and its survival, because we are human scientists. So as people, we should really be seeking action, not only for the climate objectively, as some sort of scientific set of phenomena, but as the environment for people to preserve their conditions of life, for collective survival, for collective flourishing, and as people understanding the gravity of scientific evidence about changing climate, about extinction, about rising sea levels, and about increasing pollution, we need to understand what kind of action to seek. And that's why today's topic of climate justice is important because it is the essence of the collective action that we need to seek. Justice is, it's not about technology. It's not even about relief efforts or new inventions. Justice about, is about benefits and harms caused by the climate emergency and how these should be distributed. Yeah? So the call to action has to be something to do about how do we think about our responsibilities as researchers, but also as citizens and as teachers with respect to this essential question of climate justice, which has different dimensions of justice between generations, the young and the older, um, between rich and poor citizens, between rich and poor nations, and also between those people who may have lost been denied or had their citizenship eroded. Yeah? So that includes asylum seekers, refugees, migrants, people on the move. And because when they have been forced to go on the move, um, they have lost their very right to have rights and to claim them. And they've lost protections for those rights. So uh, climate justice also between higher emitters and others. So we have heard about um, mitigation uh, versus adaptation. And in fact, Philip Alston in his report had noted um, that only 9% of all the discussion about human rights content was about mitigation. Yeah? More than 90% of the talk was about adaptation. But it's the poor people and those who suffer who have to adapt. It's the rich people and those who have benefited who should mitigate. And I think, so we need to focus on that balance, that justice, the balance of justice between mitigation and adaptation, and focus a lot more on mitigation. Yeah, Be bearing in mind that higher emitters have more responsibility. And between majority privilege versus minority and disadvantaged sections of society, and uh, for example, the gender dimension, but not only the gender dimension, because not only gender justice, but different kinds of social justice uh, have to be reflected in the intersectional requirement to capture the needs of who is being marginalized, who is being most impacted by climate change. So, okay, the call to action then, um, I think, should be very comprehensive. Yeah? Any crisis is not just a total negativity. I think we've seen from the community uh, response from the big rally that we had at the weekend and all the talk that we've had over the weekend about that, crises in themselves are also positive opportunities to re-examine what our society is about. And as Philip Alston remarks in his report, climate change should be a catalyst for our governments 
to fulfill long ignored and long overlooked rights, including the rights to social security, water, education, food, housing, healthcare, and decent work. And it's got to be about just taxation and emissions control and environmental regulation. So, um, and that monies that are raised through taxation and regulation can be used to fund protection programs and adaptation programs. So I'm just going to go around and ask you for your call to action to round off tonight's um, uh, one by one. We'll start with Neve. It's difficult to go first. Um, I think I'm just going to have to borrow really from Greta Thornburg um, when asked maybe quite a similar question. And she just reflected on, we're in a climate emergency and we're going to have to begin to act like it, that it's a real emergency. So I suppose um, as activists then, not letting our politicians forget that. I think find a group, find a community, get active and let your politicians know. Um, basically, we can all get involved and it's not entirely up to one individual or a certain group of people. Maybe just because they're marginalized or you're at a higher advantage. So what I would say is uh, to the marginalized in inverted commas, my comment would be let us stand up and hold anyone responsible accountable. And to the governments, I want to say let us take action, climate action, and not just passive action, but active action. Action that will be seen and not just talked about. Thank you. I used to work for an environmental management firm in Cape Town and we used to do environmental impact assessments and one of the sites that we went to was uh, this University of Cape Town and they get a frog, it's called the Cape Frog, it's very special, we will not see it anywhere else except for Cape Town and when we explained to construction workers uh, that they need to protect the frog, they didn't get it because their concerns were bread and butter every day. Uh, they were concerned about housing, they were concerned about uh, their situations back home when they live work. So they didn't care about the frog, they were just there to build the library, get out of there and go find another place to build. So when we talk about climate justice, it's important that we um, always speak with awareness about other people's struggles because you lose people when you don't acknowledge their own uh, struggles, when you don't support their struggles. So if you called uh, an asylum seekers in Ireland today to come and to a talk about uh, climate justice. Many might not show up because they've never seen you talk about direct provision or ending their misery in direct provision. So you need to start talking about transgender people in Ireland. Um, healthcare, they only have three doctors. You, st you need to start talking about housing. Um, you need to start talking about all the other issues that affect human beings, not just the one that you only uh, are focused to, uh, on. It is urgent, but they are also just as urgent for other people as well. Thank you. I, love that. Um, I would say read the law, use the law, change the law, and if necessary, break the law. <laughs> I would encourage everybody to join an environmental organization, and um, we need your support. You know, we need your we need your physical support. We need your we need your physical presence at things, we need your involvement. There's so many different groups. And there's also this new group, Extinction Rebellion, that's been set up. I'm sure there's a, a, a group in Galway. And they run meetings, and it's a way for people to come from all walks of life and get involved in, in activities. You don't have to break the law, but they, they're involved in kind of important symbolic actions that I think we should all support. Rebellion Week is coming up in October. You'll see a lot happening in Dublin, and support it. Put up with some inconvenience because there's an important message being communicated. I have a very simple action that, if taken in the next few days, will change an awful lot and nearly everything. At the moment, the government is just about to approve a projects, a list of projects that would bring frack gas from America into Ireland. Um, so, activists like me and lots of um, environmental groups have worked together to bring forward a motion which has been brought to the doll by Breed Smith. And now Sinn Féin and the Greens and a lot of independents have already signed up to it, about 34, maybe up to 40 TDs have already signed it. In order for us to 
make that work, like in the same way as we ban fracking. In order to keep that frack gas out of our energy mix, in order to stop that, imagine if you've an electric car in 10 years' time and it ends up being run on frack gas. It's just un un unimaginable. Fianna Fáil need to support that motion. Um, and that is in the hands now of people like Timmy Dooley, who's from Clare, who understands fracking. We wouldn't have banned fracking without Timmy Dooley. And so Fianna Fáil are at a position now where they're looking at frack gas in the Irish energy mix, and they don't want to see it. But in order for them to oppose that, they have to stand up to people who want 500 to a billion euros spent on infrastructure. We can't afford to spend a billion euro in Ireland on gas infrastructure. Now, that's in the hands of Fianna Fáil, and that decision has to be made in the next couple of days. So that's something that can happen from here. So people here who know people in Fianna Fáil can take an action on that. They can sh you know, spread that message, because that isn't in the media, but that's happening right now. And we can, so we've seen Leo move. Now let's see Fianna Fáil move, and then we'll see real change. Thank you. Um, well, I'm <laughs> while we have the state as it is, and while we have the government as it is. Um, I would encourage everybody to think about running for office themselves because it had never occurred to me in about three years of pestering people and writing letters and talking to people. Eamon Ryan said to me, well, would you run for us? And honest to God, it had, it had never even crossed my mind because I think we leave politics to people who already move like politicians and who already look like politicians and have this kind of bluster and shake hands and love photos and and that's not a qualification. Like we've almost, it feels like forgotten like that they're supposed to serve us and they're supposed to represent us, but how many of us really, really feel represented by what we get? So I would encourage everyone just to think about it. Think about running, like, you know, it's our democracy in the end. Okay, so will I um, just invite me to <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. Yeah, just thank you so much for coming. And I should say that we have um, Philip Alston, Professor Philip Alston, lined up to give another one of our lectures in the series on the 19th of December. It will be in Dublin, but we're thrilled to say that. Thank you again so much to the six of you. Um, and we really hope that this conversation will just grow. Thank you.